All right, we got the recording going as well. Thank you, Jenny, for, for the introduction. Great to have everyone here today. This is my first experience doing a, uh, a webinar like this where, where everyone will be able to chime in afterwards, not through a chat. So excited to, to see how that goes and hopefully everyone behaves themselves. Um, but you know, certainly very excited to have uh, Kirk and Susan with us as well today. And um, just to dive right into it and, and kick things off, um, you know, certainly be a great place to start would be just to get an understanding for, for those that might not be familiar with your organizations about kind of your current um, emerging manager program versus manager approach and, and um, you know, how you go about um, you know, defining those, uh, those types of managers. So, um, Kirk, maybe we can kick it off with you to, to get things started. Sure. Happy to be here. Good to see some familiar faces. How you doing, Mike? Um, so we're the Emerging Manager Program for the Teachers Retirement System of Texas. Our job is to build relationships with the managers at early stages. So because of that, we're focused on criteria that is driven by fund size and AUM. So I can invest from fund one through fund four. I can invest in a fund up to a billion dollars and I can invest in firm sizes of $3 billion or less. We invest in real estate, private equity, infrastructure, and the public markets, including hedge funds and traditional long only. We partner with Grosvenor Capital Management and the Rock Creek Group as extensions of what I consider an extension of my staff. They perform the IDD and ODD on managers that come into the portfolio. However, the portfolio is completely under our control. So that's the background for Texas teachers. Great, Kirk. And Susan, um, how, how do you guys approach the emerging diverse manager space? Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Susan Lehman. I'm, I'm an investment officer with the Los Angeles Fire and Police Pensions Investments Division. Um, so the pension plan serves about 27,000 City of Los Angeles Fire and Police personnel, and um, it's currently about $30 billion um, currently. Uh, so I oversee the private equity portfolio, and we actually have three different portfolios. Um, we have a core private equity portfolio. We have a portfolio for uh, commodities-related private equity funds. And then we have a private equity portfolio that's for uh, private equity emerging managers. And we call that the Specialized Manager Program. Um, so the pension plan does have uh, emerging manager policies for both the public and private markets portfolio. But since I oversee the private equity portfolio, I'll be covering uh, our private equity specialized manager program. And the specialized manager program is for first, second, third time funds, $500 million and below. And that's for uh, managers that we don't already have a relationship with. The program is also for our existing specialized managers, and um, that's for their uh, second or third time fund, $1 billion uh, or below. And then uh, the managers are not required to have these other characteristics, but we do look for them for this specialized manager program. And these characteristics are um, ownership by women or minorities, uh, ownership by members of the LGBTQ community, U.S. military veterans, uh, persons with disabilities, headquartered or investing in the city of Los Angeles, or investing in economically disadvantaged markets, lfpp.com. And currently, the Specialized Manager uh, Program has about 80 uh, private equity emerging managers, about 100 funds, and it's about 14% of our private equity portfolio. And for the managers, uh, the objective is to graduate and not all can graduate to the core portfolio, but we do have, um, we have had 13 uh, specialized managers graduate to the core portfolio. And in terms of how both of your organizations approach um, this, it seems it's a little bit different. Kirk, your organization has a dedicated kind of it's codified in policy uh, as a um, actual allocation within the program, whereas Susan's yours is more a, pol a policy around, you know, just making sure that emerging diverse managers are included. 
can you both talk a little bit about that and Kirk, maybe to bring it back to you about how um, the, the program fits within the overall uh, allocation of the, the total plan? Yes, so for TRS, what we've done is we've made the Emerging Manager Program a part of the overall asset allocation. So the, the program is technically 1.1% of the overall allocation. So as the trust grows, the program grows. Uh, the, the thinking behind that was to make it a known. This is, this is what it is. This is, is the, the, the allocation, no ambiguity around the, the funding. We are part of the capital plan. So because of that, uh, certain conversations about, well, how much capital is flowing here and how much capital is flowing there, it's just much more easy to have those conversations because it's systematized. This is the allocation. This is where you are in your allocation. This is what needs to be done. As the trust grows, then the amount that the, the program can allocate will grow with the trust. Yeah, for the uh, for our private equity specialized manager program, it is a dedicated program. Um, we have an actual allocation towards the program. Uh, the last allocation was about two hundred million dollars to the program, and you know we reduce it as we make commitments, um, and then we go back to the board and we ask for an, an additional allocation to the program. On the public market side, um, you know, an emerging manager can uh, go in through an RFP, and we've done RFPs. Um, uh, where we specific look specifically look for a public manager, emerging manager. Yeah, that's another difference. We do not have the RFP process. I know a number of our peers um, from my time in Illinois have the process where the, the RFP is part of, of the selection process. Maybe even a presentation to the board is part of the selection process, but that's not part of the process that we use here. And that's that's a great segue into talking about sourcing. You know, that's certainly an important aspect of of identifying and and um, allocating to emerging diverse firms. How much of that falls on the investment staff um, yourselves you know, versus leveraging consultants? You know, Kirk, as you mentioned, you have um, you know some external providers you work with. You know, Susan with the the consultants that you work with. How how do you um, what what's the best way for managers to get on the radar screen? How are you, um, you know, tracking or or making sure that your consultants and advisors are, are um, specifically focusing on this area? So, Susan, maybe to kick this over to you first. Yeah, so um, we in the private equity portfolio, we have over 200 private equity managers, uh, 500 funds and only nine investment professionals uh, to manage the entire um, investment program for the pension plan. So as you can see, we we have to depend heavily on our private equity consultant, and they do a lot of the heavy lifting for us. Uh, and our private equity consultant does uh, most of the sourcing. But I do take calls from managers, um, and also we you know I go to conferences and I meet them there. Um, we also get meeting requests from emails, and specifically I'll attend um, emerging manager conferences where again I can meet a lot of uh, private equity emerging managers. And um, also help you know you know raise awareness for our specialized manager program. Uh, the plan, uh, the pension plan, did conduct uh, an emerging manager virtual conference a couple of years ago, and I believe we'll have another one uh, either this year or uh, next year. Also, uh, the board has been very consistent in providing access to emerging managers, uh, you know, committing capital to them. And I believe that the consistent focus on, um, you know, providing access to emerging managers has helped with sourcing. I think it helps with sourcing when the emerging manager community sees that the board and staff are serious about uh, supporting emerging managers. Yes, so TRS is, uh, I guess, in a very good state as far as our staffing. We have over 200 people in the investment management division only. Uh, so because of that, we have a broad array of resources. I have an advisory board for each one of the asset classes that I mentioned earlier. So a senior member of that asset class is 
involved in every call that I make with our service providers, uh, Grosvenor and, and, and Rock Creek. But more importantly for me, when I was at Illinois before I came here, it was pretty much a one-man shop. So I got very used to being very hands-on with, with my managers. And so that's something that I brought to this relationship as well. So the expectations are for, for us here at TRS that there's a two-way flow. It's not just a situation where the, the service providers are bringing us managers, but because of the emerging manager conference that we host, because of the sheer amount of time that I'm on the road at other events, we have a significant amount of inflow uh, that we use to help determine who we want our service providers to have a conversation with. So you can come in through my staff and we'll push it out to our service providers and vice versa. If our service providers are recommending a manager to us, the manager is not going into the portfolio until we as a staff have had a conversation with that manager as well, because that's the only way to have an informed conversation about the manager, because it is never a situation where somebody is saying, this is what we think, but me or my staff cannot have an informed dialogue about whether we agree or not. How do each of you approach feedback to managers that are um, that that you are having these conversations with? You know, for a lot of managers, getting those insights into you know the no or or the not right now can oftentimes be very very valuable to them as they go uh, to approach other allocators. Uh, is that something that you try to make a part of your process? And what does that feedback typically look like? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to start. I spend a tremendous amount of time having conversations with managers who aren't at a stage where I can invest, maybe won't be in a strategy that, that I, I can invest in, but are at a stage that advice is valuable to them as they move through this life cycle. Um, it could be something as simple as, this is what your pitch book says, and it really doesn't resonate to somebody like me. I was on a conversation with uh, a, a young manager that's launching in June of, of this year, yesterday. And it was interesting that the conversation was such that it was obvious he was used to talking to high net worth people. And eventually I had to stop him and say that everything that you're saying doesn't resonate with people like me because there are certain things that we need to know. So set up another call with that manager to say, okay, look, I've given you my feedback of what you need to do. You go do it and then come back to me and try this pitch again. And this is not something I'm going to invest in. This is, this is, this is a, a, a product that doesn't really fit what I need. And I've already told them that, but the point is to try to make this ecosystem thrive. So you give advice when you can, you try to help polish up the conversations. You tell them who are good resources as far as capital. Public pensions aren't a good starting place for capital for a lot of strategies. You need to go through the family offices and the high net worth before you get to us. And Susan, before you jump in on that, Kirk, you know, maybe just to, to kind of follow up on that, are there common uh, mistakes that you see managers make when they are presenting to you that would be useful for everyone to be aware of? You know, thinking about as they um, you know, think about getting themselves out there to market their, their strategies? A lot of times it's just lack of knowledge because what I found is these managers are superstars at their shops. So they've, they've, they've done a great job, but they've been insulated. They've been, the only, only thing they had to worry about was this silo and they were fantastic at that silo. Marketing, nah, didn't have to worry about that. Fundraising, nah, didn't have to worry about that. So the, the basic parts of the communication is, is, a lot, is where a lot of them need to help. Uh, so there's no like, don't do this, don't do that. When you walk into a shop, you need to know what they're focused on. So research the website, understand if, they're, if, if we haven't made a VC investment in the Emerging Manager Program since 2008, then VC is pretty not, it's not a good use of your resources to try to pitch us because it's just not something that we're going to do. So be aware of that. 
And then be aware of if you can go to a deep dive with the person across the table. Some people you can't, but if you can, then that is your chance to illuminate what it is that you do. I, I'll tell people up front, I can ask a question here and if you answer the question in a way that I that that resonates, I'm going here with that question and I'm going down below with the question. So a lot of that is if you have the ability to to step into being very detailed about your sh strategy, do so. But if it's, if the interest isn't there, don't overwhelm them with details about this and that or the other, because then you're like blanking out and nothing's working at all. Great. And Susan, how do you approach uh, manager feedback? Yeah, similar to Kurt, um, you know, pr Portfolio Advisors is our private equity consultant, and they'll provide guidance, um, you know, to calls with emerging managers. And same with me. Um, I try not to overstep too much and, um, you know, but I, I'll also provide some advice. In terms of how each of you look at uh, measuring success of these programs, certainly one of the bottom lines is always going to be the, the returns and the success of these managers in, in bringing, um, you know, uh, alpha back to, to the plans. But are there other things that you kind of look at when you're measuring or tracking these portfolios that, that help you kind of define what, success, what is successful? Um, Susan, maybe you can take this first. Yeah, um, you know, prior our priority is, you know, returns, good, consistent performance for all of our investment portfolios. And uh, uh, for specialized managers, I would say that, you know, since the manager's track record might be kind of skimpy, uh, it's a new firm and not a lot of realizations, uh, we may have to look at other factors such as team experience, team development, you know, robustness of back office operations, et cetera. For our core managers, we can look at, you know, several of their funds already. So we might have a better sense of their track record and performance. So, um, for, so I would say, even though um, the emerging managers and core managers are measured the same way, um, I would say one of the differences is that it, it's easier to judge the core managers because they have more solid proof points for us to judge them by. For us, the performance is the key. The what we've done last year for the first time, we we were able to quantify what we call the emerging manager experience, which means that what we did was we looked at the program, we looked at our EM Select asset um, pool of capital, and we looked at the graduates, and we looked at the returns for all of those together. And what we've saw, seen is that the EM program experience has generated positive value for, for one, three, and five years. So the program between its core program, the transition program, and the graduates over the years have produced positive alpha. That's the first thing. Now, my measurement of success for managers could be anything from that they've gone from a two-person shop or a three-person shop to they've actually hired a chief operating officer. Um, I, I, I back the manager. I, I normally talk to managers well ahead of, their, of, of, of them actually getting capital. And I remember I was talked to a manager for like three years, worked, went through the stress of the first fundraise. Uh, they were doing the second fundraise. I was walking to an LPAC meeting. And I remember walking into their offices and the office was full of people. And I was proud. I'm like, yes, you've done it. You're real. This is it. Look, I walked through these doors and this is a real shop. And I remember when you were a one person trying to build your leadership team so things like that is important as well, that, that you see the managers grow over time and that they build the, uh, the necessary infrastructure to become a bigger manager. And that, that really ties into the conversation around graduation. And, and um, as Jenny mentioned, with our um, January special report that we've been doing for the last 10 years, 
I used having that decade of data. I was looking, you know, solely at the traditional, you know, public markets um, programs. But one of the things that was kind of eye-opening looking at the numbers was that of the 116 managers that were in the programs 10 years ago that remain active, 43 of them are still in these emerging manager programs. Um, you know, certainly the goal is to have these firms become not emerging. Uh, so when you think about graduation and you think about how to help these managers be able to grow to, um, you know, move out of that um, designation, um, how, how have you approached that? And Kirk, I know you guys have a, a pretty unique um, setup to, to try to solve some of that problems. Love to hear your thoughts on that. And then Susan, after that. Sure. It is the most difficult problem for any emerging manager program it is moving them from the program into the main portfolio. Um, so TRS, when I got here, TRS had seven graduates from the program, but the program has been in existence since 2005. And in my mind, we needed to do more. Um, TRS agreed with that. And we put in place a system that we call Emerging Manager Select. And what it does, it gives us a quantitative measurement tool to allow us to identify our best performing managers. We were able to build this for private equity. We were able to build it for real estate. We have it for public markets. We have it for infrastructure. What it does for us is identify those managers. And instead of us having a conversation with the asset class is saying, we think this is a great manager. You should probably take a look at it. Well, that's a tough conversation. You're like, well, you, you, you know what? I don't have time because I got to underwrite fund 12 over here and I don't have time. So we took that conversation from there to, hey, look, this is a top tier manager. This manager has been a top tier manager for the last three years. You need to pay attention to this top tier manager because the numbers say it's top tier. And what it's allowed us to do is to then take that subjective part of the conversation out, make it objective, and then allow the trust to say, is this a fit? I know what my best performing managers are in this program. Which one fits what I need right now? So what we've done is from implementing that program in 2019, the number of graduates have changed from seven up through 2019 to now we're at 14. So we've doubled the number of graduates in pretty much four years after putting this system in place because it allows us to subjectively or, or, or objectively identify the best performers that we have. Susan, you had, you had highlighted the some of the successes you've had with graduation. Can, can you talk a little bit about how your plan has approached that? Yeah. Um, so since January 2023, I've had over 35 calls with private equity emerging managers. And I know it's a very, I can see that's a very tough business. You know, it's tough to start a new firm, to get those commitments, to grow, uh, scale the firm, et cetera. Um, also on our public markets uh, side, we have two uh, public public market emerging managers, and you know uh, for the public market side, uh, you you graduate after you have three billion dollars in AUM. So we've had those firms for uh, several years now, and you know they're trying to grow their business. Um, they're not quite at thirty billion dollars. So I, I can see, like I said, it's very hard to con you know. Um, you know, continue to grow that, that the business um, once you start a firm. Uh, for us, uh, I think we've had a pretty consistent rate in in graduation. Um, you know, over the years, like I said, we've graduated thirteen. Um, you know, thirteen specialized managers. But again, it's it's very tough. Uh, we have limited funds, right? So um, we only have so much to put towards emerging managers and so on. So I don't think. Um, you know, we have any answers, but I think the key is just to continue supporting, um, you know, emerging managers. You know, when they, the, they grow. 
Yeah, and, you know, certainly one of the the aspects of that is is the investment consultants and advisors continuing to, once they're aware of these firms and and working with these firms, how much work they're doing to bring them to other clients. Do you do any tracking or or ask your consultant to provide any insights around you know, what work they're doing to identify and then also recommend um, these diverse or emerging managers to other clients? Susan? Uh, uh, Portfolio Advisors is our private equity consultant, and we've had them since 2010. Uh, we've had, um, we, we have a good working relationship with them, and they're familiar with our program, uh, our staff, our board, and, you know, they know our priorities. Um, I, I don't keep track of, you know, if they have other clients uh, who go into the specialized managers. Uh, you know that that we um, that we have in our portfolio, or the ones that they uh, take uh, calls with. Uh, I believe that they they do have some clients of theirs that um, you know do uh, commit uh, capital to funds one, two, and three, though. And you know, Kirk, obviously, with your specialized consultants, they're you know allocated to specifically for this reason. But when you think about some of the other advisors that TRS works with. Is there any kind of work that you do with them to get understanding of their efforts around emerging diverse firms? Well, not not so much outside of the the service providers that we have on hand, but I will say that I spend a lot of time being resource a, a resource and a reference for the managers that I have in the portfolio. Uh, so, and that's with consultants, that's with other pension plans. Uh, so I, I'll have conversations where people, where people will call me up and say, hey, what do you think about such and such and such? Uh, so I think that that's, that's important because the communication and, and the ability to share knowledge, I think, is extremely important for these managers uh, in order to build their, their AUM. The, the gatekeeper issue I know is very sensitive. To a lot of managers, I, I understand the frustration sometimes as they they try to get to us and they think that it's very difficult to get to us. We sort of solve that because between the conference, between the 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 outreach that we do, that we we have more access than than would be the norm. But that being said, it's up to the consultants to if if. If they know there are certain programs that are out there, if they know that the New York's out there, the 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 Illinois are out there, the Texas's are out there, then that's a valuable resource. So it's it's very difficult for a consultant to say I can't find an option in any asset class, because literally all they have to do is pick up the phone and call one of the big public pension plans, and you will find any information that you need. That's certainly one of the reasons we started our diverse manager directory a few years ago is because we were tired of that excuse. So anybody that is an emerging diverse manager on in the uh, on this call, uh, diversemanager.com, it's free to submit your information there. Um, it was utilized by a lot of allocators that are just wanting to make sure they're aware of some. So so definitely check that out. Um, but Kirk, you, you brought up a good point there and a great chance to maybe allow you to pitch a little bit on, on the conference that's coming up next month. Um, you know, we, we did a feature with you in December looking at it. And one of the main things that we talked about was that you're really looking to get more allocators engaged in the conference and, and give them more exposure to managers. So love to hear a little bit more about that. And then from both of you, how does that network look? How often are you speaking with other allocators and are there common challenges that you're finding um, that they're raising that, um, you know, people should be thinking about how they can try to help them solve. So Susan, uh, Turk, actually, we'll start with you to talk about that conference. Yes. So the, the Emerging Manager Conference is a virtual event that will be happening on February 28th of this year. The conference used to be live uh, pre-COVID. And as a matter of fact, I think we literally had the last big event before the world shut down and I did not get any COVID cases that I'm aware of out of that. So thankfully, but in COVID, we, we pivoted to virtual and in doing so, 
we realized there were certain efficiencies that we were able to utilize that allowed more, I guess, effective conversations. So that being said, the conference is driven by the participants being allocators who are willing to engage with emerging managers. Last year's conference, we had 65 allocators who were willing to take meetings. Hopefully we'll have that number or more for this year. What we try to do is give the managers a 15 minute window to make that in introduction. Um, I know the managers think and expect if they had an hour and they could shake hands, that money would just magically flow a lot faster. But the 15 minutes is a good opportunity to talk to people who they may normally not be able to talk to. No travel costs, no, no issues as far as only one person from the organization being there at the conference. In this case, because it's virtual, you can get entire teams from, from certain allocators. Thus, you can have more conversations. Uh, we can filter, if you're in private equity, find allocators interested in private equity. So what we try to do is build an ecosystem that allows them to have more informed and better communication with the allocators to have that introductory conversation. Susan, what does your network look like? I know you mentioned you, know, you guys might be looking at doing events going forward, but in the current kind of structure that you have, how much are you relying on other allocators and, and um, you know, how do you leverage the, the network? Yeah, I think it's a pretty robust network. Um, you know, I, I, like I said, I go to, you know, private equity emerging manager conferences um, and, uh, you know, uh, we're getting a lot of email uh, emails from, you know, emerging managers uh, to, to meet with me, uh, have calls with me and so on. But it does seem like there is kind of like a subset of emerging managers where they're kind of like, uh, I would call them pre-emerging. They're not institutional quality. And I, I think they're kind of maybe left out a little bit because they're uh, we're not aware of them unless they, you know, email us. So I think the institutional quality emerging managers, you know, I think there's a good network. Um, but I think that, um, you know, like I said, that subset of like pre-emerging or pre-institutional quality uh you know, emerging managers. Uh, I'm just kind of wondering how you know we can maybe reach out to them more, um, even though you know they're they're probably still too early for us to commit to. So I would say, um, you know, again, uh, just that subset of pre-institutional quality managers. I'm just wondering how you know we're able to reach out to them, and maybe you know with like Kurt's conferences um, and the conference that we'll be. Um, uh, you know, conducting either this year or next year, maybe we'll be able to reach out to those to that, like I said, that subset. Well, one of the one of the ways that that we can expand our reach is working with with I call the 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 industry specialist groups, people like AIM, uh, people like NAA, people like NAIC, people like NASP, um, being involved with them and their memberships often gives us access to these managers at a stage where either they're thinking about spinning out or they just started. Uh, so that's that's one way. We also work with, with people like the 100 women uh, wave. So the, I think that's one of the ways to get access outside of, of the normal channels because it, it allows people who may be at a bigger shop but who, but who are thinking to get access to you and bounce some ideas off you and, and things like that. And, and Kirk, that's a that's a great point. And one of the things that I've been pushing back a lot about over the last few years is you're seeing a lot more focus in the emerging and particularly in the diverse manager space on more established managers versus being able to get into firms early on in their process. You see a lot of corporations, other allocators that, you know, you pick, you know, name brand diverse manager, and then they wipe their hands and they say, look, I invested in the diverse manager where we're doing what we're supposed to do. That's not addressing the pipeline issue and the fact that most diverse managers are emerging because they don't have that solid asset base. How do you try to balance that um, dichotomy or whatever the, the correct term would be 
um, when you're thinking about your pipeline and the managers that you're you're addressing? Yes, I, I that's a great question. So part of it, and, and it was mentioned in, in in the chat, is these conversations are over years. I mean, so a lot of the times I could have a conversation with a with a manager at a certain stage, and capital won't happen for three or four years down the road. Uh, but I, you have to be willing to have those conversations. You have to be willing to engage at a stage where you know that they're not ready yet, but you're still willing to engage. I'm a big proponent of, even though, so we have a, we have a supply issue. The supply issue is that the people who can launch the firms have to come from the big shops. The big shops have to provide the opportunity for seasoned professionals to come out of that shop at a certain level that they can even attempt to do this because you have to have a certain amount of capital to even take this chance. So it's not even the fact of us finding them. We got to have the supply. We got to have the bigger shops that allow them to exist. So I think that focus needs to be spent on those shops. Are those shops providing the necessary landscape for these people to grow, build the necessary expertise, and then spin out. As that improves, I think we have enough touch points to get to these managers at various stages. And, you know, Susan's right. Some of them don't come on our radar, but maybe they should. Maybe they should be talking to the RIAs and, 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 and the family offices to get to the point that they're institutional quality. If they connect with us before that, we'll share that information. But the key is they have to have the capital necessary. They have to have the experts, expertise necessary to spin out. And, and Susan, along those lines, your organization is preparing to do a survey of your existing managers, correct? Yeah, we actually sent out um, a DI survey, I think about a month ago, and we're just, we're, we've gotten a lot of the responses already. Um, so from that survey, we'll compile the data and see where everyone is at um, in terms of their DI uh, policies programs. I kind of think, though, that I, th I think as a manager, you would be at a disadvantage if you don't have at least a DEI policy, right? So um, I'm expecting kind of good results from that survey, um, and then uh, we'll present it to the board in the ne next couple months. Have there been any discussions around how you will track that going forward? And, you know, certainly the, the key for, and one of the things that, that we've talked about in our Emerging Manager Monthly publication is, you know, even if the numbers aren't good now, you need to start somewhere. So having allocators and managers that maybe don't have attractive numbers, still being willing to share that saying, we understand this is where we are, we hope to be better. How do you have you talked about how over a, a longer time frame you'll kind of track that and and work with managers that maybe don't have those numbers to understand how they can get better? Yeah, for our private equity program, uh, portfolio advisors actually does have all of our managers, both core and specialized managers, uh, complete the ILPA, the Institutional Limited Partners Association, uh, DI metrics template. So that's been going on for several years now, and they'll continue to do that. Um, in terms of maybe increase increasing the diversity of their teams, I don't, you know, obviously we can't, you know, mandate that they increase the diversity of their teams, but I think we can continue to talk to them about it, and then um, and then see where they're at a few a uh, few uh, years down the line. Uh, not quite sure yet on how we're going to track that. Um, but again, for the private equity program, we do um, track it through the ILPA uh, DEI template. One one other aspect of of that, you know, somewhat related to a question that came through in the chat, um, you know, and certainly Kirk in in Texas, this has uh, come up more recently, and you know, just overall in the national discourse, is the issues around litigation and and um, kind of the push against DEI as a focus. Um, 
how do you, you know, certainly in California, that's always been something that's kind of, um, you know, been, been a sub issue that, you know, those plans have somewhat figured how to deal with, but, you know, Kirk, how, how is that, has that had any impact at all in your work? Um, you know, how have you been addressing that or helping constituents understand, um, you know, where this fits in versus some of that, uh, some of those legal issues that have arisen and then Susan, you know, as I mentioned, California, obviously having a little bit more exposure to how to balance those two against each other. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. So the program is an emerging manager program. However, when you look at our, our metrics, we are 53% diverse. So over half of our exposure is with diverse managers. I inform people who ask about that, that if you look, the correlation based on the metrics that I gave people earlier, the correlation between emerging managers and diverse managers is extremely high because of the metrics that I gave earlier, because of the fact that they're launching new firms, because those firms are smaller, et cetera. So you naturally should pick up a significant amount of diverse managers by focusing on the area that we focus on. I've had no issues here in regards to how the program is structured. I am aware, however, of the concerns that are out there. I think they are legitimate concerns. The issues that we have with some of the litigation against some of the, of the funds that are out there we will see what happens there. Um, the pushback on DE&I, as far as within the corporate environment, we'll see what comes of that as well. But in the end, our job is to make money. My program is 53% diverse and we have positive alpha. So the program has done what it's supposed to do. It's very difficult to push back on something that's actually making money and, and doing the job that it's supposed to do. Susan, how have you approached that? Yeah, so um, especially being in LA, you know, I feel like I'm in, in a little bit of a bubble. Um, you know, when people, um, you know, DEI is kind of like second nature to us, right? Uh, so, um, I, I don't really, we don't really think about it, um, but we are, we are careful about, you know, not putting, putting um, like quotas and, and, and so on with the program. For example, with a private equity specialized manager program, you know, um, it's open to non-diverse teams as well. Um, so yeah, um, we haven't had any issues or pushback against uh, including DI in our investment uh, program, but we are kind of mindful of what's going on as well. And Jenny, at this point, I, I've got, I could ask questions all day, but uh, I know you you know, certainly there's many people on this uh, call that I'm sure have, have their own questions they'd like to ask. So love to um, hand it back over to you in terms of how we want to. Uh... Yeah. Thanks, Matt. This was, this was so fascinating. And uh, yes, just a couple of our friendliest, a uh, hundred a hundred friends um, who are on here with us today. So again, please, we encourage you to enhance your connectivity, use the chat, meet someone that you haven't met before. This is all part of building the ecosystem. Thank you guys for popping some questions in the chat. Um, I'm just going to go in order of how I received, and we would love for you to, um, if you're able to come off mute, just say hi, introduce yourself, and ask your question uh, so we can all just um, familiarize ourselves with each other. So Howard Sanders, you are first. Um, uh, off to you, and then I'll hand it over to Rendell. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this uh, excellent convening. It's it's really great for you to take the time to organize this. And uh, Kirk, Matt, nice to see you again. And Susan, I look forward to meeting you in person. Uh, I'm wondering how closely you track the strategic asset allocation of your overall program. Um, is that something you take into consideration when you're developing the slots for a particular year that, you know, if a 
secondary fund, for example, uh, might be uh, in the slots of the general program? Is it more likely to be in the emerging manager program? Excellent question. So the the asset allocation is closely tracked, trust me. Uh, so <laughs> when you're over your asset allocation, they are very much aware, and then you have to come down to your asset allocation. So because I am over my asset allocation, as is all private markets, by the way, I should have said um, I'm 80% private markets, 20% public markets. So as all private markets are over their allocation and I'm over my allocation, then my capital to be deployed gets reduced. So that's the case for 2024. I look at each one of the asset classes as my clients. So it's highly unlikely that I will bring anything in the portfolio that does not resonate with my clients. So you mentioned the secondary fund. If the private equity asset class was interested in building a secondaries portfolio, I would know that from the advisor that's that's from that team talking with me. And then I could start looking for that type of profile. So what I try to do is find out where resonates with the asset class and then work to have an option that will have a pathway to success. Great, thank you. Yes. Oh, thanks for the question. Did, did you oh. want to respond to that or? Yeah, if you could, it'd be really helpful. Yeah, no, we're always mindful of our asset allocation uh, for the private equity program. Our target allocation is 15% and we're currently uh, at 17%. So each year we have to be mindful of uh, how much we commit to our private equity portfolio. Uh, we did go down in uh, at the annual commitment pacing. Uh, we went from 900 million in 2022. Uh, we went to 800 million in 2023. And for 2024, I expect we may do 750 to 800 million dollars. Um, for specifically for secondaries, we don't do too many secondary funds because um, with you know 500 funds, we we think of ourselves almost like a you know a secondary fund. Uh, but we will plug in secondary funds uh, from time to time. Great, thank you. Thanks, Howard. Okay, so uh, uh, Sachi, if you're able to unmute and raise your hand, and, and please correct me if I if I mispronounced your name. No worries. Thanks. Hi, my name is Sachi Trivedi. I'm the founder of Trident Capital. It's an India fund, long only. Uh, Cork, nice to see you. Um, the question I have is, I totally understand, and I think both Susan and Cork, you know, have said that some of these conversations, you know, take years, and I think in our industry. Time of diligence, so I respect that. How can we, as emerging managers, stay in touch with you guys without being annoying, without being pushy? It's the easiest thing is to add you to the distribution list, but I do not expect that the moment my newsletter hits your account inbox, you will, you know, that's the first thing you will read because I'm sure you are inundated by basically all sorts of newsletters. So. How do we do it? And someone, by the way, said on, on the chat, call Kirk twice per week. <laughs> so I will, I, I, I guess I will, I, I will take that, Susan, unless you want to jump in on it. No? Okay. Um, that's a delicate balance. There is, there is no other word for it. The, the fact of the matter is you do need to keep us informed. I normally try to keep that to like every six months because it's no need to do a monthly type of check-in because uh, I mean, I'm not paying attention to the market like that. It's, it's, it's not important to me. What I like is to have data points that will allow me to say, okay, over this six month period, this fund has done this versus X, Y, Z that is done. That's supposed to be a similar strategy. So yeah. You can send a newsletter, you can check in every six months or so. I think that's reasonable. Uh, it is a marathon. So, you say check in. Is it like we request, we, we 
We should request you for a meeting with the send an update email. No, update email is fine. I mean, I think that, look, I would have told you if I'm looking for the strategy or not already. So you would have had that conversation already. So then it's a matter of just, hey, send me a, a, your quarterly update on in June or Ju July and your quarterly update when you send it out in January. Okay, so Kirk, you. maybe maybe to jump in on that as a question, because I think part of the reason managers get concerned about not following up enough is that eventually then you decide to do something in that space and then you and you forgot about them, right? They, they didn't follow up with you quarterly and they did the six month thing. And in that six months, oh yeah, I forgot about you guys. How do you have like, how do you internally kind of track that so that if something does come up, you you do have that list of managers to say, okay, here, you know, I'm doing India long only equity. Here's my list of managers. Do you do you have a way that you're tracking that that can help maybe some of these managers sleep better at night if they do kind of back off a little bit? Technically, your service provider's biggest benefit is being able to comb the universe, to be able to to be able to aggregate that data. But honestly, for each one of the asset classes, the short list of, 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 of possibilities when I'm looking at that particular asset class, I've already talked to them. I mean, it's, 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 it's very difficult for somebody to fall through the cracks. Because if they're on my radar, they're on my radar. And it's something that, that I'm aware if I'm going to turn on that particular possibility, of who to talk to and 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 who not to talk to. So and th and that's not using an RFP process. If you use an RFP process like like some of the other plans, then you've already broadcast out there, and anybody can join. So it's very difficult to not be on the radar if you're using the RFP process that many people do for the public markets. You know, I joke that it's kind of like dating, right? Um, you know when you're uh, being wanted. Um, I think for me, for the specialized men, you know, well, actually for the private equity program in general, um, I think once or twice a year, if you want to reach out and email me and provide an update, you know, I think that would be, you know, sufficient. Um, I think if you kind of do it too many times, um, you know, it just kind of, it it it, it can fall flat, right? I mean, um, so I would say maybe once or twice, just check in with me. Um, I see that we have a question in the chat from Eddie, and I think we can make this our our last um, our last question to close us out because I think it's a great one. So Eddie, are you able to unmute and just briefly introduce yourself to ask your question? Um, I did also add uh, a couple of links to the chat. Um, just spotlighting uh, Matt's Emerging Manager directory and also one from Clade, which is IADEI's platform. Eddie, over to you. Great to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Good afternoon, uh, Eddie Ramos. I sit on several uh, mutual fund boards and I've been a GP, a, I am an LP, and I am uh, advising a FinTech platform. So doing a bunch of things. So. Um, good to see everyone. I, I fundamentally feel like all the dramatic changes that have taken place with movement and money in this ecosystem has taken place 98% of the time because there's someone that looked like us that was now in the position of being an asset allocator. And, you know, that could be a sole fiduciary, that could be a governor in place, a mayor in place that, that was making these changes. So, my question for Kirk, you've been doing this a long time, and Susan, I'd love to hear your perspectives on how do we get more people that are on this call, for instance, to be in your position where you're making asset allocation decisions as opposed to clamoring for access to capital, access to capital, access to capital. How do we get control of capital? Susan, you can start. Thanks, Kirk. Um, do you mean, uh, how, how do you get access to our LFPP's capital, the pension plans capital? 
Well, in essence, you're in a position, and Kirk and many other people, of uh, people who are ethnically diverse, right? Who sometimes enter these systems and start making changes and start bringing up the issue of allocating more money to diverse managers and that kind of thing. Sometimes you have to agitate, and sometimes you're you've got uh, partners with you, um, like a governor or a mayor, who really is also pushing the issue as well. So, uh, my point is, a lot of these programs have been successful because there are people that look like us that are in, in those decision-making positions. How do we get more? I, I guess what I'm asking you is sell people on the idea of trying to, you know, become an asset allocator, why it's so important to make sure that we're all advancing the ball uh, on all sides of the table, not just on one side. Yeah, I, th I think we are doing um, a lot. Um... You know, we we have our, our specialized manager program on the private equity side, and we also have uh, an emerging manager policy on the public market side. And for LAFPP, we've been uh, supportive of emerging managers for a very long time. Um, and uh, I believe that the city, the, the mayor of the city of Los Angeles is very supportive of DEI as well. So I think, uh, like, like I mentioned um, before, um, I think L being in LA, we're in a little bit of a bubble. I think DEI, we're we're all very focused on DEI. Um, I think for me, it's it's maybe more that we have to try and encourage um, other organizations, um, you know, to also focus on DEI. So I think for us, we we are doing a lot, but I think it is trying to encourage, um, you know, maybe other uh, organizations, um, you know, to focus more on DEI. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll I'm try not to make, quite sure how to do that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to make this quick because, Eddie, you, you bring up a very good point and that it's a point that I've been talking about more and more. Everybody focuses on the Black Rocks, the Goldman's, the Chases, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What can they do about, about their diversity? The simple fact of the matter is we have the capital. If there is one person of color or a, of a gender in the room, why shouldn't there be three? Because it changes if you have, you want diversity of decision-making at the manager, right? You want diversity of decision-making at the big shops. You need diversity of decision-making at the allocators. So I'm 100% with you there. One of the things I've been doing is I've been spending more time speaking at colleges, speaking to students, trying to educate them on what we do. And I use one classic example with these MBA students, and I'll try to do it in like 20 seconds. I tell you, you're gonna, you, want, you wanna go work for Goldman Sachs and you're gonna get there and you're gonna be working 18 hour days and you're gonna be grinded out and you know what you're doing. You're building a product that you can sell to me. So come on my side of the table because you won't be working for 18 hours. <laughs> You'll be given the money. They're building the products for me. So I think the more we can get people of color and gender into our role, let them know what it is, the better we'll be. So I'm with you 100%. And, and Eddie, to, to support some of the, the numbers there, uh, we do a report every July that looks at women and um, minority CIOs at the largest defined bet public DB and, and um, foundations and endowments. Our numbers from last year was... Uh, there were, let's see, 13% of CIOs of the largest, 100 largest DB plans were women, uh, and 28% of the largest nonprofits were women uh, CIOs. And then on, um, in terms of looking at it from people of color, 14% uh, of defined benefit plans had a minority CIO, and 10% of uh, nonprofits had minority CIO. So, um, those numbers have remained relatively flat in the five years that we've been tracking those numbers. Um, but also the other thing there that I, you know, especially LA Fire and Police, I remember, you know, I've been writing about the emerging diverse manager space for 18 years ago. And LA Fire and Police, specifically with Susan being here, a lot of their work in this space was driven by the trustees 15, 20 years ago that were very engaged in this space. And I think not enough uh attention is paid to the trustee makeup of these public pension and 
nonprofit boards, but then also making sure that, you know, these diverse individuals that are getting into those roles are not afraid to speak up and, you know, aren't just happy to be there and, and you know, don't want to ruffle feathers or where they actually speak up and start to, you know, push this issue with their staff because it's largely always going to be top down driven. So either by who the CEO, CIO, executive director is or by the trustees. So um, certainly that's another area where a lot of the emerging managers and diverse managers doing your work to get on these boards and doing your work to, you know, bring these issues up at your colleges, you know, get on your endowment boards, bring these issues up. Um, it can very much be something that's um, you know, organically done through, um, you know, the investment professionals that are on this call. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie, for your for your question. This was, uh, you know, not we could continue, you know, di discussing and having discourse, which is the point of these conversations. Um, so thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm going to hand it over to our executive director, Mona Lisa, to close us out. Yeah, so this was, uh, I, we were oversubscribed just for all of you to know that this was in a tremendously successful convening. Um, for those of you that were able to get in, thank you for being able to be here. What that shows us as a, as a community is this is a topic that we need to continue to have. And with the last uh, question with Eddie, that's, you know, what we do at IDIF is try to pr provide education and a community for us to answer those questions. So we will take that question and convene and create a convening on how to get more allocators in this space. So we encourage you to stay consistent, staying on top of uh, the work that we're doing at IDIF. And one more um, ask, we are a nonprofit. We bring this to you uh, free of charge so that we can continue to um, give access to more diverse leaders. Please, if you believe in the work that we do, please go to our website. We would love your support. Matthew and Susan and Kirk, thank you so much uh, for your work, for your leadership, and for all of the, those of you on a call. We look forward. We will be um, posting our February convening, and we may be making changes given some of the feedback here to continue the dialogue. So if you have any other asks of the organization, we are here to support all of you. So thank you and have a great day.